everyone, it's Lacey Skulls from VH1's Rock of Love. And this is Hawk of Love, the new podcast. This isn't just reality, this is real life. Hey guys, what's up? It's Lacey motherfucking Skulls. And this is episode 17 of the Talk of Love podcast. She's only 17. That's so crazy. It's been 17 episodes. So I just want to welcome you guys. Thank you so much for for tuning in and listening and watching on YouTube. So um, I have a very special surprise guest for you guys. I I was so excited about this person that I decided that I was not going to tell you and I'm going to let it be a surprise. So I'm going to reveal that in a few minutes. I'm really, really excited. You guys are going to be stoked. But first, (laughs) I want to talk to you guys a little bit about something that is really important to me. I want to talk to you guys about music. Um, Now, I figured that because of Rock of Love and because it's centered around Brett Michaels from Poison, I think it's safely, I think it's safe to assume that all of us equally, you guys and me, we all love music. That's something that's very, very important to our lives. And that's essentially what brought us all together um, with this podcast because of that reality TV show. So um, I found out something recently in the news that uh, was kind of upsetting to me, but it's it's sort of making sense that this is happening. It's sort of what has been happening over the last few years. Uh, so I was living in Los Angeles, California for 14 years, and uh, I used to listen to the radio station K-Rock, uh, and they were the, the self-dubbed world-famous K-Rock, where they played rock music. And I just found out that they are going out of business, and that really broke my heart, to be honest with you, because... You know, I I love music. Um, People used to make fun of me on Rock of Love because I was always telling people about the fact that I'm a musician. And, you know, it did maybe come across in hindsight that I was saying that to brag. But the reason I always talked about the fact that I'm a musician is because music is just so important to me. And I, I really love connecting with people from that perspective. I mean, literally, you guys, if you get in a room with me and if you if you bring up music with me or if you bring up animals. I can talk about either topic literally all day long. I just, I'm super passionate about music, super passionate about animals. So um, the whole thing with um, rock music specifically, that's that's a genre of music that we all love. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been watching the trend over the past, you know, 10 or 15 years. And it feels to me like rock music is on the decline. And it's a little scary for me. You know, I talk, I've talked to my husband about this and his perspective is that everything is a pendulum. And he's like, you know, right right now, rock music is not really super popular, but that could be because that pendulum is here. Eventually, it's going to swing back here and, and, um, and rock music will be popular again. I hope that he's right because how it looks to me is that the genre itself is dying. Now, as a musician, um, I recognize the importance of all genres of music. I, I don't like to say one genre is better than another genre, or this genre is cool and this genre sucks. Like, who am I to say that? It, it's all personal taste. But um, I also think that it's important for, just as much as it's important to promote different cultures, genres of music are essentially reflections of culture. So we don't want any of the genres to, to disappear. That would be a real serious tragedy. But if you go back in time and, and look at the history of rock music, you know, um, some would say it started with Elvis Presley. Uh, others would say it started with like Motown. Um, you know, it, it's it's different perspectives. But as far as hard rock music goes, if you go all the way back to like 60s and 70s and you think about Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, and if you go uh, further forward in time and, you know, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and all of these like iconic rock and rollers, um, and uh, then, of course, you get into the 80s, which is where I started really becoming aware of rock music and the iconic bands back then, uh, Motley Crue and Poison and Guns N' Roses, you know. Uh, then n- the 90s was my favorite decade for music. I was a total 90s girl. I loved Lollapalooza. I went to every single one. Um, I loved all the Seattle bands. Nirvana was one of my favorite bands. Alice in Chains, Soundgarden. You know, of course, I loved Nine Inch Nails. That, that's like my all-time favorite band, Nine Inch Nails, Marilyn Manson. You know, these are all incredible bands and artists. And I mean, even if you don't like the ones that I just named, there's, there's so much rock music that genre was so rich, full of all kinds of different bands um, that were, you know, driven by guitar. Um, then you would get into the 2000s and, um, you know, there was like Muse, but that's where I kind of feel like uh, rock music started 
to go on a decline. You know, I know there was like the white stripes and black keys and, you know, KG Elephant and bands like that. That wasn't really something that I was into so much. I, I really liked the more intense kind of harder rock bands. But um, I think what ended up happening with rock music is it's, it started, you know, Lars, the drummer for Metallica, was really under fire for the whole, um, uh, uh, oh, my brain's not working, you guys. Um, Scott, help me out. What was, what was the downloading uh, the downloading app where Napster. Napster, thank you. Okay, thank you, Scott. Napster, yes. So he was under fire for Napster, but he was totally right. You know, Napster was a site that promoted free downloading of music. And when Lars from Metallica was saying like, this is wrong, people are like, oh, what's wrong, Lars? You need to buy yourself another, you know, Lamborghini or whatever. But that's not what it was about. What he was fighting for was the smaller bands that didn't have money. Their source of income was coming from, um, from selling their music. And that was being taken away from them, that source of income by the time the internet was really promoting free downloads. And it sucks because one thing that used to piss me off so bad, this would get my blood boiling, is when people would argue, you know, musicians and, and bands should not be charging for their music, they should do it for free. Or you would get the accusation of like, oh, you're just making money, you're just making music to make money. Well, music shouldn't be about making money, it should be about doing it for the love of the music. Okay, yes, in theory, that is true, but I hate when people think like that because what you also have to remember is how are musicians supposed to earn a living? You know, if you're working nine to five, you don't have time to write an album and go on tour if you're working nine to five. You gotta make money off of your music in order to be able to fund your music. And also, it costs a lot of money to record an album. You have to pay for drum heads and guitar strings and bass strings and you know uh, studio time. Or if you have your own studio, you have to buy all microphones and computer software and you know or pay an engineer. Um, then there's like going on tour and all the expenses with that. You have to pay a producer. You have to pay somebody to, you know, to master the album. I mean, there's so many expenses. So like hell yeah, you need to be able to earn a living so that you can pay for all these expenses and pay your rent on top of that. So, you know, the album sales were very important. The record labels were a big factor in the demise of these bands because the record industry, they signed horrible contracts with these artists and made them sign away so much of, you know, a lot of the money ended up going into the pockets of these executives instead of going into the pockets of the musicians. So it made it harder for them on that level. So it just just continued as the years went by. It's harder and harder and harder to earn a living with this stuff. Now for pop acts and hip hop and things of that nature where the, the act is a single person, that's a little bit easier. But if you have a four piece or five piece band, that's more mouths to feed. Um, so it's complicated. Um, but where I'm going with this is I, I'm watching, you know, people not supporting music and not supporting rock music in particular. Now K-Rock is, you know, going out of business and, you know, and now with the lockdown, the only way that bands had left really was to, to make any money was to go on tour. Now they can't go on tour. So people are like pretty screwed right now, musicians in particular. And it really makes me sad. And I mean, think about it, you guys, if we had Imagine right now today, okay, there's so many angry people, whether you're a conservative or a liberal or a Democrat or a Republican, there's a lot of anger and frustration on both sides. Can you imagine if Rage Against the Machine came out swinging like right now? You know, where where is the Rage Against the Machine? Or even like, where is like the David Bowie? Or imagine if like um, Prince was still alive and he put out an album. Or what if Marilyn Manson or a band like that came out right now. And I mean, can you guys think of one band that's a new band, not an old band that's on their 10th album, but a, a brand new band that is in the vein of David Bowie or Prince or Jane's Addiction or um, you know any of these iconic bands. I just feel like, where are they? You know, unless I'm missing it somehow. Um, one question I have for like the 20 something year olds of you guys who are watching this, who who is your rock band that you listen to? Do you have rock bands that are newer as in like you know came about in the last 5 or 10 years? I would be interested in your perspective if you're like 18 to 25 years old, please put it in the comment section. But um anyway, you know, I I don't really have a a resolution about all of this, but all I can say to you guys is like please any chance you get to support rock music, please do buy those albums, buy those 
concert tickets, support the arts. And also if you have uh, kids, definitely encourage them to, especially the girls, encourage them to pick up a guitar, learn to play the guitar, learn to play the bass. You know, we need another Joan Jett, you know, how awesome would that be? We, we really, really need that right now. So, you know, encourage your kids to play. Maybe you yourself, it's never too late to learn an instrument, but, um, you know, encourage your schools to have a music program. And it's just so important. We cannot let rock music go away. That would be such a tragedy. So, um, you know, hopefully this resonates with you guys. It's something that really means a lot to me. I know we all love music, but it is up to us to um, keep it alive and keep it going. So there you go. Those are my thoughts of the day from Lacey Motherfucking Skulls. <laughs> so anyway, enough of that. Uh, now I would like to introduce my next guest who you guys still don't know who it is. And I'm super excited to announce this person. And I'm not even going to say her name. All I'm going to say is... Don't threaten me with a good time. Hey, Tiffany, how are you? Oh, it's so good to see your face. How have you been? Girl, how you doing? Hey, girl, hi. <laughs> I have to tell you, I did not tell the viewers of the podcast ahead of time that you were going to be on. I saved you for a surprise. So I, I wish I could hear the viewers right now because they're probably flipping out because everybody loves you. You were on Rock of Love for a relatively short period of time. You didn't do any of the follow-up shows, but you are definitely one of the most memorable of all the girls because of all of your iconic lines. You're so amazing. Girl, you won't believe you popped my cherry today. <laughs> I love it. Two was, cherries. Was it good for you? It was even better. Uh -huh, nice. Two cherries, not one, but two. Uh -huh. Oh, two cherries. What, yeah. what, what are the two Sky cherries? Versus Skype and then the podcast. Oh, oh, this is your first Skype experience too. Yes. All right. Well, you know, I know how to wine and dine. <laughs> so I have so many questions for you, and I'm just so excited to get into this. To start with, um, how have you been? What has life been like for Tiffany since Rock of Love? It's been, you know, it's, um, I've accomplished a lot. Um, I got my gun card. I mean, I'm now a union steel worker. Okay. Along with the RN, so, you know. Um, I bought a house, my house, no man, you know. So um, the other thing is, uh, uh, the only tragic thing that um, my best friend killed herself within this time. We're best friends for, I don't want to put a damper on the thing. Oh, but, I'm sorry. You know, like, it's just, it took me a long time to realize that suicide, that's a terrible issue, and, you know. It's amazing how often this comes up. I, I I didn't know that about you. And I just want to start out by saying, I'm really sorry. Um, I lost my mom to suicide and it's just unbelievable. Oh yeah, how many people it affects. And I just want to tell you, I'm so sorry. I Oh my gosh, this must be hard for you. It was really hard. It's it's been about fourteen years now, so I've had a lot of time to heal from it. I'm I, but I'm like I'm only just now at a place in my life where I can actually talk about it openly. I, it took me years where I just I couldn't even speak of it. It was so so um, devastating. Um, so, but yeah, it's it's unbelievable how many people uh, have to cope with that. And I'm so sorry for you. My heart goes out to you, honey. Oh, well, thank you. You're so it's sweet. I'm very, very proud of you, girl. Oh, well, you're very kind. Thank you for saying that. Well, so let's let's talk more about you. So you, um, during Rock of Love, were you a nurse? Am I remembering that incorrectly? RN, yes. Okay, okay, uh, that's what you're saying, RN. Okay, sorry, I wasn't following you. Registered nurse, yeah. Oh, got you. It's oh, that's a awesome. nurse, you know, not for Halloween. <laughs> a lot of people question you know, she's not a real nurse. It's like, idiot, look it up. It's easy. Illinois Department of Regulation, first and last name. It'll say if it's current, you know, if I had any issues, any suspensions, revoked. It's there. <laughs> that would be a weird thing to lie about, too. <laughs> a lot of people lie about registered nurses. I don't know why. Yeah. If I was going to lie about my profession, I would say I was like a like an astronaut or like a Viking or something. <laughs> It'd have to be something really exciting <laughs> for me to lie about. Well, when I would go out clubbing or whatever with my best friend, you know, she'd say, I'm a registered nurse. I'd be like, I'm a stripper. And they wouldn't pay any attention to her. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well, can we talk mm -hmm. about your, your daughter? How old is your daughter? She just turned 25, April 29th, the day before my best friend's uh, birthday. Oh, okay. Awesome. Uh, that passed away. Um, I polluted my whole front lawn. I made 
Man, girl, it came down in buckets that day. Yeah. I mean, buckets. I made uh, candles out of noodles and everything. I mean, um, she dates Donnie Buckus, which is Dick Buckus's grandnephew. Okay. Yeah, and she was in a family picture with them. I'll show you the picture later because you can't tell which one is Buckus. I don't know if you know anything about football. I'm sorry, Lacey. Oh, no, that's okay. I'm not, I was actually wondering. I'm like, I'm not really a football person, but I was like, I'm sure if she keeps talking, I'll figure out who she's talking about. So, Girl, I keep a football in my car. I, I can throw a mean spiral. Oh, that's I awesome. Know, really? Football, you guys were playing, but it wasn't football. <laughs> well, I wasn't playing anything that day. I was trying to run and not get like killed by Jess. <laughs> I suck at mm-hmm. anything having to do with like catching or throwing. It's not my oh, area of, don't of give expertise. Enough credit. <laughs> oh well, thank you. So, um, okay, so let's go into okay, but you're but you're happy though. You you're doing well in life aside from what happened yeah, with your friends. No, <laughs> and you're in Chicago. Yeah, I'm uh, 12 minutes shy of there. I, I've been um, suburbanite since 2009. Okay, okay. Yeah. Is that where the South Side booty came from? <laughs> yeah, I got it for my mom. I got a big booty girl. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, okay, so let's talk about, let's rewind all the way back to 2007. Um, how did you find out about Rock of Love? How did you end up auditioning for the show? Actually, I was contacted on MySpace, and they didn't tell anyone from Illinois that it was going to be Brett Michaels. They just said it was an 80s band, a rock music, a musician. They never said who it was. You guys all knew. We didn't know at first. It it took a little bit of time. We knew, well, I knew by the time that I went to the house uh, to start filming, I knew by then. But are you saying that you didn't know up until he pulled up on the motorcycle? Correct. Which I oh. was going to take that. Believe me, if I was thrown off, I was going to go ride that bike around California because they left it unlocked. <laughs> I have two Harleys. Oh All right. My. That's crazy. So what were you thinking when Brett Michaels showed up? And that you, you did you recognize who it was immediately? Yes. Hey, Lacey. Yes. Are his extensions in that freaking do-rag? Oh, are you talking about Brett Michaels? Yeah, do you remember when everybody's, like, pieces were falling out? And, you know, my hair is real. Yeah. It's a headpiece. (laughs) (laughs) Headpiece. But he's like, oh, you know, that happens to me. I'm like, (laughs) you know, because makeup and... uh, they really do wonders for him, you know, compared to up close. Well, I think that I, from what, I, from what Brett has said himself in interviews, he does extensions. I sort of give him a little bit of a free pass for that because I feel like there's a pretty severe double standard for guys when it comes to, because like if you think about it, girls can have like fake lashes, fake hair, fake nails, fake tits, fake everything. Like some girls even do their makeup contouring so much that you like you don't even recognize them with makeup off, you know? But then guys who actually do suffer from like balding issues are expected to like not partake in any of that, you know? So I, I kind of feel sorry for oh, guys. No, he got my vote on that. He <laughs> got my vote on that. Yeah. I mentioned to you about the, the uh, reunion. You did great, girl. I was proud of you. I was oh. probably one of the only ones besides uh, two other people that were cheering you on. Oh, you're you, so sweet. Are you still singing? Are you still? Uh, yeah, I actually, I, I haven't been for the past six months just because I've been focusing on this podcast and other things like that. But yeah, I'll always be doing music and, and singing and touring and stuff. I and mean, that's my soul. Those are the two things. My- oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Interrupt her. You're good. Go oh, I was just going to say, um, those are music and animals are my two like passions in life that I'll always have going on forever. But that's very kind of you to say. I, I wasn't um, a favorite in the house. I was definitely a villain um, character. And so the girls like didn't love me, but you weren't really there long enough to experience that that villain character in me. But honestly, had you stayed in the house, you probably would have been friends with me and Brandy C and all that because you're just so much fun and, and you're so... Um, like silly and carefree. So you probably would have been my friend had you been on there. Would you say so? Absolutely, girl. <laughs> I, you know, um, I, I never hated on you, even like with the band and stuff. I envied you, oh. you know? <laughs> and 
Run out to fun, you right? know? That's what I say. <laughs> You're so sweet. Well, um, so I was going to ask you, um, okay, so when you you auditioned, they contacted you through MySpace. You auditioned. You didn't know it was going to be Brett Michaels. You were So we're there on, on the outside, um, those uh, bleachers or whatever they had a standing on. Brett shows up, you recognize him, and then they go through the process of uh, telling s- s- some of the girls they could go in the house and others had to stay outside. I didn't know they were going to do that. That threw all of us for a loop when that was happening. And so when... When you didn't get picked to go in the house, um, a lot of the conversation we have here on the podcast is like how much was real versus how much did the um, producers have a say, you know, manipulate the situation. So when you came and knocked on the door, which I was amazing, I'm so glad you did this. You're like, hell no, I'm not going home after all this shit, I'm coming in. Was that something that you decided on your own to do and the producers went along with it or did the producers tell you to do that or how did that all go down? Girl, it was a process. I mean, like, I was like, here's what I'm not going to do. You know, I said, I took time off of work for this. I said, I'm not going to ship back to Chicago. It's snowing there. I mean, it's just like, really? Why would I? I mean, seriously, like, no, I actually had to tell. I, I wasn't like asking. I was kind of telling them. Good for and you. I was messing around with the microphone because they still had it on me. So I was like playing with the numbers or something, you know on it and and then and, you know I was sitting there with Kim and somebody else but I'm like this is a bull crap you know I mean that's that ain't right you don't send people home once they got really there really fucked up and do you remember we had to sit in the vans in a parking lot for like hours without talking to each other before that happened did, did you have to do that as well yeah. I mean the whole process was so slow they put you at the hotel they um I mean, it's just kind of like they don't treat you like you should be treated. You don't sit there and wait at the hotel for a couple of days. You can't use the pass. You can't do the, you know, you can't go to the, you know, the gym. You can't go swimming. I mean, I don't, California, there's not even a balcony. <laughs> you guys all have balconies that are closed. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, it was brutal. They, we were just like stranded, like prisoners of those hotel rooms. But then sitting in the van for hours and hours in the parking garage of U- UCLA before. Who does that? That was insanity. Because I just remember, they, I think they just weren't ready for us yet. They like got us in the vans too early. And we weren't allowed to talk to each other because they didn't want us to like get to know each other with the cameras not there yet. And I will never, until the day that I die, forget sitting in the van silent for hours with stranger girls. We couldn't even get out and pee or anything. That was brutal. Um, and then, yeah, and then they drove us up and got us all set up. And I felt so sorry for you girls uh, that they, after all of that, that they made girls go home. But that makes me so happy, Tiffany, that you, that that was your idea to go, fuck this. I'm not, I didn't do all this for nothing. I'm coming inside. You guys can all go fuck yourselves. That makes me so happy that that was genuinely you that put your foot down and not the producers. And I love that you talked them into letting you back in. That's amazing. Uh, There was no talking. I wasn't going to take no for an answer. I I mean, I was planning in my head, hey, there's a bike that's on, that's free game, you know? I'm like, I I know I'm going to stay around here. I'm telling you now. And um, as far as like, if you look at the editing, it was caca. You know, like I I had to rehearse that freaking banging on the door. Now, if I was banging on the door, I'd be using my fist. You know, I wouldn't be going slap, slap, slap. You know, I wouldn't be doing that. You know, yeah, that's not my style. If I wanted to, you know, bang on the door, I'll bang on the door. And then, you know, at, when I went home, I before that aired, I um, talked to my daughter and everything. And I spent some time with her. And then it came on and I showed her what's. Look it, I'm in the house while I'm physically knocking on the door. You know, because yeah. I'm in the house when they're showing me knocking on the door. It's just, you know, little things like that. So that part was they had you like go and redo it. I don't know how many that part. Okay, okay. Wow, that is amazing. That is so, so cool. So you come into the house and the girls, I can't remember how long we'd actually been there before you came in. I don't think it was that long, maybe like an hour or so. Um, But yeah, the one thing about that house was 
they really just were like pushing the alcohol on all of us. And um, I definitely have had my fair share of being annihilated and too drunk on these shows. And everybody knows my infamous, you know, falling off the bar in Las Vegas, where I decided that chugging Jägermeister was a good idea. Um, but uh, for you, uh, did you come in and, and, and you just started drinking with all of us and it just hit you a little hard? I mean, we didn't get to eat that day too. I remember that. Um, well, you think about it. They, I mean, who doesn't love a drunk girl? <laughs> That's what I say. I'm just saying, who doesn't love a drunk girl? Right? I mean, and I didn't like pass. I never passed out. Somebody put an article that I passed out. I'm like, I didn't pass out. No, you didn't. Like, when I, you, you know, when I was going to sleep on the couch, I mean, instead of those nasty ass Ikea beds, that the Ikea bunk beds, I'm like, oh, this couch is better than one of those things. <laughs> and they were like filming in on me and they put me snoring. I'm like, I don't snore. I mean, <laughs> like really, like they edit. <sighs> yeah, they're pretty brutal like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I so mean, that was all edited just to I'll make it real. If I fall, if I pass out, I'll be laughing at myself. Man, I got twisted last night. <laughs> I fell, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Passed out. You know? Yeah. Well, so I actually rewatched um, Rock of Love somewhat recently. And one of the things that I forgot at the time, but watching it back, I remembered, the girls in the house split into two different groups. This was more after you were gone. And it was like the party girls um, versus the other girls I personally call the stick up their ass girls. That was sort of like my nickname for them. And it was like, you know, Mia, Magdalena and that whole group. And watching it back, you know, I was definitely a villain. I gave girls a hard time. But one thing, uh, one rule I have for myself, even being a villain, one thing I don't do is I don't gang up on people. And um, like, if I have an issue with somebody, it's it's like a one-on-one -on -one thing. But I remember during um, your stay there, there was like three, four, five girls that were sort of all ganging up on you at one time. And you were clearly at this point, it was out, outside by the pool. You were clearly really drunk. So it was really unfair of them. It, like that wasn't even like a fair fight. There was like four or five of them and one of you. And they were just being super, super shitty to you, I thought. And it really made me think of like mean girls in junior high school. They all just like got to form to click pretty quickly and just were being super, super shitty. And you you held your own as as long as you could. And at one point you sort of broke down and teared up. Um, well, definitely, I'm sorry to uh, Oh, no, you're good. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, it was the first time I was away from my daughter like that, you know? And I had drank, of course I was drinking a lot. And I'm not used to not being with my daughter. Yeah. So like that kind of affected me. It had nothing to do with what they were saying. Like, I can handle that, you know? If they're going to dish it, they better be able to take it. Like that altercation you had with Dallas. Like altercations you had with Dallas. Yeah. Dallas apologized to me the next day for being mean. Oh, that's nice. I didn't know that. You know, she, and you know what she did tell me? She's bipolar. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So I don't know if that helps you out, but no, she was cool after that. She's like, you know, Tiffany, I'm sorry. They told me to do that. Really? The the producers told Dallas to fuck with you, basically, is what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, well, that explains a lot. Because I thought they, they were pretty rough to, on you. Thank God I didn't go to fight because, like, I'm a fighter. I've always been a fighter. I don't back down. I have no fear. I thought so. you were I thought you were really cute. I thought and I don't mean that in a demeaning way. I thought that you just like you were trying to keep a good <laughs> attitude and you were just um, you know, kind of being still sort of jokey like they were getting all themselves all worked up and you kind of had this like kind of jokey sarcastic vibe going for for most of it, which I thought was pretty good. Um uh was going to ask you, um, your your one-liners were just brilliant. The whole like, don't threaten me with a good time is just, has become like the phrase for that entire season. Like everybody loves it. Uh, is Are these phrases that you've always had or like, where did that come from? You had, so, you had the something about hearing. I ever used it on, the first person I ever used that on was Michael Jordan. <laughs> oh my, my God. What's that story? Birthday, the first time I ever seen anybody like on TV or, you know, that day I seen David Copperfield at Spy Bar. And then I went to another bar and uh, the, it was roped off, you know, where Michael Jordan was. I was just about to leave and I, I went 
back in because I was like Michael Jordan. I'm like, MJ, yeah, 23, hell yeah. So then, I'm, you know, one of the guys were there, you know, one of the bouncers or whatever, he had two girls standing by him. And he was drinking a, drinking a Carmona. I call Coronas Carmonas. <laughs> so I'm like, I talked to the guy. I'm like, hey, yeah, let me let me uh, holler at him for a second. He's like, uh, yeah, hang on a minute. So he went to talk to him. Michael Jordan's like, yeah. So then I went over there and then uh, I'm like, dang, you drink my drink. You're drinking Carmonas. I said, you know what? It's my birthday. He's like, really? I said, yeah. And he like, happy birthday. It was really nice. Put his arm around me, gave me a kiss on my cheek. I'm like, damn. I said, I think I need another one. <laughs> so, you know, because I was like, oh, it was like surreal to me. Um, and then he did it again. I'm like, damn, boy, don't threaten me with a good time. He's like, <laughs> you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> a week later, him and what one need like in a horse. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that story. That is incredible. How did you end up somewhere where Michael Jordan was? And you said David Copperfield? Yeah, David Copperfield was at Spy Bar. I used to date somebody over there. And um, he told me he was there. And it was like, it was it was actually, actually after Michael Jordan. Was but it I in Chicago? Picture, I don't have a picture to prove Michael Jordan. <laughs> I'm pissed about that. Oh, we'll have to take your word for it. This was in Chicago? Yes. Oh my God, that's so awesome. That's amazing. That's such a great expression. And you had a few good expressions. You had, what was the haterade one? There was like- Yeah, I mean, people said like haterade, and, but- um, Like later haterade or something like that. And this whole like, uh, ain't no booty like Southside booty. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So this is just you? You just kind of come up with these on the fly? Yeah, my girlfriends are always like, Tiffany, you need to like do a book. You know, of all your, yeah, one letters. I'm like, yeah, because I mean, they just flow. In the middle of it, I'll just, you know, it's normally when somebody's shit talking, you know, that's when I come up with it. Like it's a motivational tool for me. <laughs> that's so smart yeah. because it diffuses the situation. Like who can get mad yeah, at you? When you're saying absolutely. And it breaks, you know, any tension or. I love you know, that. That's, you have a great attitude. I think that's, yeah, that's, I mean, anytime someone's being shitty, yeah, just, throw out some humor at him and then it totally diffuses the whole thing. That's a really good philosophy. Um, yeah, but I mean, it is what it is, but like you got to think of us, we all had our own stereotypes, you know, you had, which was the rebel, right? Mm -hmm. Or the, I like rebel, rebel's good villain. I was a drunk girl. Everybody loves drunk girl. You know that. That's true. Uh, one was a hoe, you know, I'm not saying who, I mean, it is what I it is. more than one. <laughs> or a hoe, literally. Um, you know, but everybody, had, and you, know, you got to think about, there's always, that's that's what they give you, that's what they title you as, and that's what they stick you as, you know, ditzy blonde, you know, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. You know, if not, you're not, I mean, who's going to watch it? Re I mean, you and I both know reality is not reality. Yeah, I always tell people otherwise it's a documentary and it's definitely not that. So yeah, um, I that's all good points. Um, oh, you know, one thing I also wanted to clear up that I thought was a little shitty of the producers. Um, when you were having um, a confrontation with, with Dallas and Brandy M, um, they, the producers tried to, they bleeped it in a way that made it look like you might have said something racist to um, to Dallas. But then I went back and I found another version of it where they bleeped out what you said because I think Brandy M said something about that being an offensive word. But they bleeped it out at a later one where I saw I had a C, the letter C at the beginning of whatever you said. And I was like, oh, did she say cunt? Because they made it like you said something racist. Can you clear the air with, with what was said when you know what I'm I talking about? Her a, I told her she's a see you next Tuesday. Oh, did you actually say see you next Tuesday? Yes. <gasps> they are so <laughs> evil. Not, not, not only did you not say cunt, but they were really had pushed that, like you said something horrible to Dallas about Everybody, her race. I never got any backlash. I mean, people said that I said, I don't like black hair. And I'm like, no, it's back here, buddy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So I think it was just another way for the producers to, you know, 
amp up everything and make it more extreme than it was, which I don't even think was really necessary because it was already so extreme without painting girls like they're, you know, saying something racist or whatever. But um, but I, so you said, see you next Tuesday. Okay, I'm really glad that we got to clear the air with that because- Anyone who knows me knows that, you know, I went to Chicago public schools. I was a minority at my high school, minority at my college, you know? Yeah. It, my, my girlfriends be like, girl, you black by injection. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I you're saying is you're- like my nursing clinicals and everybody would be, you know, African-American. And I would go but like, man, I feel like this is show to tell and I'm the show. <laughs> break it up, you know? <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So you grew up in a diverse background and you work yeah, I mean, within I'm a diverse just field. So. Dutch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anybody who knows me, I mean, I, I, I didn't catch any slack from anybody. Nobody even repeated that back to me because everybody knows me, knows me, wouldn't say anything remotely close like that. Yeah. And yeah. if you ask Dallas, she would say this. Yeah, I believe it. And I, I think that's awesome that she um, apologized to you afterwards. I think that's actually really sweet. So um, that's cool. So then you were there, you spent the night uh, on the couch and then the next day- uh, No, they took me off the couch. What's that? After they uh, fake filmed me snoring, yeah. I had, they had a bed for me. I'm like, man, I like this. I like this couch. It was the best freaking place in- it was. It's better than <laughs> stupid I, bunk beds. The bunk beds were ridiculous. I felt like I was sleeping like in a kid's bed. It was so silly. Yeah, I mean, like, it's funny because they never filmed what was on the floor and how, like, dirty people were. Yeah. And that's the other thing. I rigged the shower to work upstairs. I don't think your shower even worked. Yeah, it wasn't quite as nice as um, it looked on the you know, when you watch it back on TV, it definitely was an interesting house. It was an interesting layout, you know, with the, like the jacuzzi in the middle of the living room, totally not practical, but, and the backyard was gorgeous, but yeah, the rooms I remember were tiny. The bathrooms were tiny. We were all kind of like on top of each other. And apparently after Rock of Love season one was done filming, I heard a rumor that the person who owned that house sued the production company because it was just so trash and so damaged that they ended up, you know, having to owe money for it or something. I don't know. That house was like, yeah. The damage. I mean, well, the jacuzzi, do you remember how scolding hot it was? <laughs> yeah. I, think I had to tell them to put a garden hose in it to pull it off. Oh, you know, really? Cold water. So, yeah. Because I'm like, you couldn't even dip your toe in it. <laughs> I think I remember that. And the <laughs> swimming pool. Oh, my God. I think I was the first one to jump in it. I've never jumped in water that was so cold before where I had to catch my breath. That water was freezing. I had THOs plus some. I know. They were just, they were going for nipples, I think. They were trying to get the nips. <laughs> Show is camera ready. Like a <laughs> so let's talk about um, your elimination. Um, did you sort of have a feeling that you're going to be going home or like, was that a surprise or did you sort of expect it? Or how did you feel about all of that? Well, I, I, I knew it, you know, I, I think they kind of know who they want on the show. That's the way I felt because I, um, I don't know how your interview get back to the original topic that you asked me that I never finished, <laughs> how, you know, they contacted me on MySpace and, uh, I went to a hotel and I was a little leery about it, but you know, cause I mean, who goes to a hotel, you know, with somebody and Jess was actually there. I oh, met her I there. Oh, so she was really nice, but um, damn, I lost my train of thought. I had a brain <laughs> fart. <laughs> that happens to me all the time. Story of my life. Um, we were talking about, uh, oh, I was asking about your elimination. And oh, and I think you're about to tell me about being uh, interviewed afterwards. Yeah. Um, but the it, commentary. Oh, so I'm a registered nurse. I mean, who wants a nurse that's boring? I mean, yes, strippers, bartenders, waitresses, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I, I really don't think that that, I mean, there was girls there that had different professions and I think it was more about, you know, um, you had such a great personality and um, I, I don't know why they sent you home first. I mean, there was a, several girls there that I thought were really kind of quiet and were kind of wallflowers. So um, maybe it was because you weren't supposed to be there at all. I, I don't know. I thought, I, th I thought they should have kept you. I mean, you made great TV. Well, you know that one, that detector, that freaking 
fake machine that you know, that we were doing the bed, you know, the talking dirty. Oh yeah, the the um like the boner measurer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, which I don't think would fly today. There's no such thing. I mean, I'm like really <laughs> lying. You know, like I was like dumbfounded. I'm like, to me, like I know what I I know I have a medical background, so I know this thing isn't even real. So I mean, I couldn't wrap my head around why they were even doing this. Like I, you know, I don't. I never really talked dirty on the phone. I had just gotten out of, you know, a marriage. I got married at 19, you know, it's like. Well, also to be completely honest, that whole episode of like the the dirty phone talk, that was, if you compare that to actual like talking dirty, that like is so sad and pathetic. People were like reading poetry and like talking in British accents and like any kind of like phone sex that I personally have ever been involved is like, yeah, I want you to put your thing, put, put that there and like bend over. Yeah, bitch. Yeah, bitch. Take it. Suck it. Yeah, yeah. Stroke it. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you that's, go, girl. <laughs> that's the dirty talk that I'm, I'm familiar with. Like, yeah, you gotta tell a guy because they're stupid, you know? <laughs> I, <laughs> I've just never, if somebody called me and wanted to do like phone sex with me, I'm like, okay, sure, let's do it. And they started talking to me in a British accent. I would have to hang up on them. <laughs> that was so ridiculous, that whole thing. That whole episode was just I hilarious. was trying to make it funny. I was going to talk about, you know, playing ring around the bedpost because, you know, to <laughs> me that was, shit was funny. You know, I, I like funny. Funny is like, the best medicine, you know? <laughs> I agree. I completely agree with you. Um, yeah, I, 100%. So, um, okay, so let's talk about after Rock of Love. So you go back to Chicago and how are you feeling about it? Before you saw it on TV, how are you feeling about the whole experience? And I'm only asking because I've interviewed some, many of the girls from the show and a couple of them, not very many, were like, yeah, that was so much fun. I would do it again in a heartbeat. The majority of the girls I've interviewed have said like, no, that was like traumatizing. It was horrible. It was embarrassing. I would never do that again. Um, how did you feel about your experience? Because I don't think you had the best experience versus what it could have been. I thought the producers were pretty shitty to you. But did you have fun or do you regret doing it? Um, it w I was out of my element, you know, because, you know, just getting put there. I mean, that's all you have to do is, that's all, I mean, like the equipment didn't work, the anything like workout equipment. Half of the stuff didn't work, you know? Yeah. Uh, there's all you could do, you didn't have music, you didn't have a TV, Music, if you made the music, you didn't have TV, you didn't have radio. Like, yeah, that sucked. You know, it's like, I, I didn't even have alcohol in my house. My parents didn't have alcohol in the house. My parents don't drink. So like to come into that, I'm not saying I'm no angel because I would go to the bar every day of the week because I lived at home with my mom and dad and they, you know, had my daughter but I wouldn't go out until she went to bed and I go downtown or whatever but you know it, it's just I was out of my element and but now that I look back I could have done so much better I mean I would have tore it up 10 times harder you know I would have caused 10 more times you know <laughs> you had been threatening everybody with a good time you are your own entertainer you are the entertainment yeah, exactly. I, I think that one of the reasons for me personally that I I had an easier time with the show and I, I didn't feel like traumatized by it like some of the others did is I really was looking at it as a show and I was looking at it as a way to like be entertaining, you know? And I think that you had an element of that as well. So, you know, it's, you know, you're, you're in a social setting and there's, you know, tons of people around you that you don't know and there's alcohol and it, and it is sort of a party without the music. You bring up a good point. That is, was kind of weird. But, um, but there, I mean, there was cameras everywhere and there was camera guys that were like, you know, five feet from you at any given time. So for me personally, I was always under the awareness, like this is a TV show. And if it got boring or if it got stale or whatever, I'm like, we got to do something because I don't want this to be a flop, you know? So um, I know some of the other girls really were looking at like, I'm here to, to win Brett's heart. Even if that had been true, 
there's cameras everywhere. Like, clearly, we're making a TV show. Clearly, we're performing, essentially. You know? Or wasn't, he, wasn't he married, though? He, okay, what he told me was that he was in a, quote, on-again, off-again relationship with the mother of his two kids. I asked him that on probably about a week in. They didn't air it but because, of course, they wouldn't. But that was right. sort of like how I knew. I, I, I got him alone at one, just like, I had like five minutes alone with him at, at one point. And I was like, I just got to find this out. Like, are you really here for love? Do you really not have a relationship? Do you not have a girlfriend? Do you not have a wife? And that's when he was like, well, I'm in an on-again, off-again relationship with the mother of my two kids. And I was like, okay. And I was appreciative that he was open with me about that because that's when I went, okay, so I'm not going to win his heart even if I wanted to because that's not what this is. So that's when I went to like, okay, let's make an awesome fucking TV show then. And I kind of went into full throttle with my um, villain character. But um, but yeah, for you too, I mean, you, so what you're telling me is that seeing the cameras around and, and you felt that this was a TV show too, more so than it was like a dating competition. Absolutely. You know, and then, you know, I could have, you know, if I knew it was him, I would have went home and look at look, look to see if he was married and look for, you know, a license. They told us it was going to be this mansion, his mansion on Acre. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the house, I was like confused. I'm like, huh? Yeah, like that was <laughs> definitely not his house. <laughs> we didn't have a place to put our clothes. It was all over the floor and everything. I'm like, this is... I mean, come on now. Yeah, it was crazy. I was the only one that packed a bunch of hangers <laughs> because I was the, one of the few girls who actually lived in the same town as where that house was. So I remember I brought so much shit with me. I brought, because the other <laughs> girls had to like carry it, but they could only bring what, what they could carry. I was like, I'm bringing vans and vans of all my shit. And I remember one of the things I did was I packed um, a, a huge duffel bag just full of just hangers and, and nothing else. And so I was unpacking all my shit and all the girls were like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, who packs hangers? That's really weird. And I was like, you're not going to be saying that after a few days. So I like, you know, had the only closet because the girls couldn't hang their stuff up. They were like living out of their suitcases. And you're right. It was like the floor was just annihilated. So the one closet that no one could use, I was like hanging up on my clothes and making sure everything was like nice and neatly organized. And I remember, sure enough, after about a week, girls like, hey, Lacey, can I have a hanger? I'm like, you laughed at me, bitch. No, you can't have a hanger. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. It was just like, a, it, the house was not practical at all. It was cool for TV, but certainly not Brett Michaels' house. And it was not a practical house by any means. Yeah. <laughs> so how, what was life like? It's commercial for you? reality is not reality. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So what oh, was life like for you after Rock of Love was, uh, well, after you left the house, when the show aired, which was probably about like five, six months later, <laughs> did people start to recognize you on the street? Like, did your what did your friends oh, and family say? God, girl, that's when it, it switched from, uh, what, it, it, digital to analog? So you almost needed cable for it. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. They were giving out these converter boxes. Okay. You don't know about that. <laughs> I'm following, I'm trying to follow along. Okay, so like if you didn't have cable, you didn't, you weren't able to watch it. But it, they just switched over, so I'm like, oh yeah, I'm up clear. And then uh, it was just that my phone was blowing up. People, were, my cousins and stuff, were asking me for money like I was like a bazillionaire. Uh, oh I'm like, wow, Are you serious with this stuff? Uh, like, yeah. that's shitty. I, I mean, but you gotta understand. We're over here there. You know, you don't see famous people walking around. You know, it's not the art of where, you know, everything is produced, made, whatever. Yeah. You know, it's not like that here. So yeah. it's very seldom you want to, you know, kind of somebody who's famous. You know, like w what age were you? You were in California most of your life? Say that one more time. You were in California most of your life? Uh, I actually grew up in Texas. I'm a Texan. <laughs> what did you move to California? Uh, because I was doing music and um, that was just the place to go to to do music. So 
I was kind of, I was, I'd been in Texas for 27 years and I broke up with a guy that I had been dating for a long time. And then after we broke up, I was like, I'm going to move to California and start over like clean slate and meet up with like, you know, um, studio people, musician friends of mine that I knew had moved out there as well. So, um, so yeah. That, and then, you know, because I was in California, I, uh, you know, I feel like because I was there specifically, I got to do Rock of Love. And so, I mean, it was fun. It definitely serves a purpose for people who are in the entertainment world you know so um but so did you like the attention that you got from Rock Wait a minute. how old were you when you you first saw a famous person how old was I when I first saw a famous person and who, and who was it uh like um not counting like rock concerts right like meeting like face to face face to face okay so when I was I think I was 15 or 16 years old um, I went with my mom to Los Angeles and on vacation. And I, we, I remember we were walking around and I ran into Tony Danza and he was really <laughs> super nice. He was really cool. So I think that was like the first like real famous person I ever met. <laughs> like a surreal, right? Whoa. Oh, so I still get starstruck with famous people. Yeah. What about you? Who was your first famous person to have met? Um, that was first, it was, it was Michael Jordan. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. It's a crazy. So I said like you guys have more opportunity with the whole, oh my gosh, stop calling me, ma. <laughs> well, it's a trip when you go from, um, uh, you know, you're the one that is starstruck by famous people to then people are starstruck talking to you. It's really, it's a weird, weird adjustment. I don't even think that I'm fully adjusted to it because I don't feel like, um, a, like a famous person or sometimes people go like celebrity. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe I'm like, I'm not even like a D list or an E list. I, 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 although I will say because of the amount of time I've spent, I'm at least like, I'm at least like an S or, or S or T level celebrity. I would say <laughs> I'm a T lister. This <laughs> mean? No, it's, I don't even consider myself that. I consider myself an entertainer. You know? I'm sorry. What do you mean? Oh, I'm just talking shit. Cause you know how they're like a lister, B lister, D lister. I'm like, I'm a team oh, lister. You are, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm way down the spectrum. <laughs> um, no, no, you don't give yourself enough credit, girl. Oh, I just, I, I like to be self-deprecated because I just feel like that's, it's, um, it's, it's I, I just poke, I tease myself as much as I tease everybody else. <laughs> but you didn't say self-deprecated. So, yeah, that too. <laughs> Only on Tuesdays. So, okay. Did you like your experience though with Rock of Love? Like, would you do it again? Did you say, would you think it was fun or would you say that you did not enjoy it? Uh, it's just, people don't understand that re reality is not reality. That's like a huge thing. Just because it's called the reality show, it's not, you know, well, it's I, not real. I think that's the one good thing about this podcast is it, it's, um, it's real. Because a lot of the girls that I've interviewed have kind of echoed the same thing. And so I feel like that's, people are starting to get it. It, it is real uh, to a degree in that like we're not handed scripts or, you know, we're not told necessarily say this, say that um, for the most part, you know, but it is an artificial environment. Like who in real life would sign up for a dating situation where it's you living in a house with 20 girls to date one guy you've never even met. Like that would, that's just like not a thing that would ever happen. So they basically, it, it is, we have to act within um, an artificial environment, I would say is the best way to describe that. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Would you do it again? Yeah. I would do it again. With yeah. a vengeance. Oh, I love it. Okay. But like, I mean, like I said, I would tear it up twice as hard. You know, I, I really. Did they talk to you about Charm School or any, or I Love Money or any of the Actually, other shows? I, the first candidate for Charm, I was there in California and they kept me in that room. For Charm School? Yeah. Oh, tell us about that. Well, you guys were like all on the bus and then they told me I couldn't go. I'm like, what are you talking about? Why did you, I mean, they did this shit to me all over again. Wait, so they, I, so after Rock of was, Love, they flew you to Los Angeles again from Chicago for charm school and then they didn't have you come on? Yeah. Get out. That yeah, is I mean, so that's like brutal. the frustrating thing because, hey, I was going to, you know, giddy up and throw on a uniform, you know? Oh I barely God. packed anything that I, you know, 
I was like, okay, I'm going to term school, you know. I'm like, what do you mean I can't go? But I think they were waiting for somebody to back out. And I was like, the replacement. Oh my God, that's insane. Right? But <laughs> I was bad, girl. They had a flight scheduled for me that night. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, right. Shit. You guys are paying for this shit. I went out, girl. I went to the beach. I went for a couple of days. I wasn't even answering the phone call because I knew they had to pay for that room. <laughs> That's smart. <laughs> so you took a little mini vacation while you were in California? Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, here's what's not going to happen. I ain't taking that flight, but no, you know. Yeah, there you go. Well, good for you. That's awesome. But yeah, you would have been amazing on Charm School. I'm I'm super super bummed that that didn't that didn't happen. So uh, yeah. So well, is there anything else that you want to um, tell the viewers? I mean, God, have you been have you done any kind of interviews or anything like this since Rock of Love, or is this your first time to kind of get the word out about yourself? Um, I do home videos. Me. <laughs> So, wait, say that again. You're sorry, you cut out. You do home videos. I do is like home videos of me fixing a washing machine, uh, changing a uh, turn signal switch, taking off a uh, steering wheel off my car. I can tell you every part of the toilet bowl, but I mean, my videos are bad and I probably make people dizzy, but. That's awesome. Is this on YouTube? Uh, yeah, I have a couple on YouTube, but like. They're not good videos. They're not good quality or Well, anything. that's okay. I think people would just like to see your personality and see you do you. How do people find you? Is it, This is on YouTube, you said? Yeah. Okay. How yeah. do we find you? Like my first and last name. I okay. I'm down with this, you know, like I said, you pop my cherry here. You know, it's, <laughs> and hey. it's just like, I don't want to FaceTime. You know? <laughs> I don't like to sit, you know, and be on a computer all day. Yeah, You know, there's always something to do, you know, whether it be I got a tandem bicycle with my daughter, you know, we go rollerblading or, you know, I'm like, yeah, I get too old for this stuff. If I fall, it ain't gonna be funny. <laughs> you're a character and you're, and you're so sweet too. You seem like a very um, compassionate, loving, kind person. And you seem like a very positive person. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's the only way to be, literally, yeah. you know? I if I can that. make somebody laugh, I'm cool with it. If they're laughing at me, tell me what you know, you're laughing at, you know? <laughs> and here's the other thing, you know, as far as like when I worked at the hospital, when I was working at Neuro ICU at Loyola, I catch the nurses, you know, going on the videos and stuff. They're going and checking me out and be like, hey, what you doing? And they like get out of it real quick and stuff. <laughs> That's you know, hilarious. Like, as far as like the whole registered nurse thing and being in the hospital, you know, I, I mean, it did nothing for my career because then they think, oh, she drinks. Uh, but, you know, everybody knows me, who you know, but some people can be catty. Oh, know? of course. Yeah. So did that did that hurt your um, your career of being a registered nurse? After Rock of Love, did that cause any problems for you at all? Or people just like, oh, we know how you are. You tell walking into a room, people talking or whatever. Um, I had a patient who got arrested and I was taking care of him. And uh, the police officer asked me for my autograph because he, he recognized who I was. Well, guess what? I was almost late the next day and I was flying. He pulled me over. He flipped his cherries on. And I'm like, shoot. And then I, I told him, yeah, I'm a registered nurse. And then I gave him the officer's name. He's like, girl, you better be careful. It's uh, deer mating season. Just, you know, I'll, just follow me out the forest preserve. Like, All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, I mean, it had benefits too. You know? Yeah. I, yeah, that, absolutely. I've had not those same exact experiences, but kind of similar experiences. So I know what you mean. So, um, well, that's really cool. And I think, you know, um, you know, obviously people know you for your actual true self. And that's how it was with my friends. Right. You know, they they know me. So they saw me on the show and they just thought it was like funny and they laughed it off, you know. But, um, I, you know, it's interesting to bring the girls onto the podcast. And I think it's really important because I think it's, I think it's good for the fans of the shows to get to know all of the girls and, and, and Big John, I brought him on as well. Um, uh, most of the girls are so, so different than how they 
were portrayed on the shows. And of course there is like an element of truth for, you know, but everybody's personality is so multifaceted. You can't just summarize somebody up based on how they are in one very unique situation, you know? So it's good for this podcast that everybody can kind of show who they are and show what their life is like and what their personality is like and what their sense of humor is like. And I know everyone's going to be super glad to see you and like, oh, this is who Tiffany actually is. (laughs) Girl, when you were doing that um, song, Shallow. Oh, yeah. So, does that mean you don't care about me anymore? <laughs> that, was, that was, I have a, a whole other song for you, just for you, Tiffany, not that one. Yeah. <laughs> that was for the other girls, not for you. <laughs> actually, Shallow was not even written for those girls. I said that I wrote it for those girls, but I actually didn't. And actually, I didn't even write that song. That song was written by my old guitar player, Chris Talks, and I'm going to give him a shout out because um, super talented, but he was my guitar player in my old band, Nocturne. And we both um, wrote songs for the band and I had my songs and he, he had his songs and that was one of his songs. And um, when uh, my band Nocturne got invited to do the reunion, I remember going to the producers, I'm like, you know, told them I, you know, I wanted to do this performance and all that. I remember going to Chris, I'm like, please let me use Shallow, please. It's so perfect. I just have to like change the lyrics a tiny, tiny bit. And I can make it about the girls. But no, I would never sing a song like that about you, Tiffany. You're awesome. Uh, <laughs> You're amazing. So yeah. Well, okay. Well, I guess I'm going to let you go. Um, it was such a, a pleasure talking to you. Um, you're just, you're so sweet and you're so kind and I love how carefree you are and I love your sense of humor. I know and I'm smarter than I look. <laughs> well, you Girl, look- it's a you. I mean, I'm glad you're doing you and proud of you, like oh. I said, and Girl, next time I want to come out there and do it with you. Yes. Well, I, as soon as this lockdown is over, you are invited to Las Vegas, which is where I am now. And um, you're definitely welcome to come here. And I'd love to sit down with you in person. Right. Put it in writing. And put it right there. I will. <laughs> I will do it. Okay. On. Okay, I have to do this to you. I'm so sorry. But you have to tell everybody what not to threaten you with. That's what I'm not going to do, Lacey. Yeah. Not- yeah, please do. Please do threaten me with a good time. <laughs> <laughs> You're amazing. Tiffany, thank you so much for taking time out to, to hey, chat with all of us. Oh. <laughs> Is that your south side booty? Yeah, I think it took up the whole frame. You couldn't see it. <laughs> it's a good booty. And ain't no booty like south side booty. You'll hurt your hand if you smack it. <laughs> It's, it's worth, not fake. It ain't fake. It's worth my hair the risk. isn't fake either. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany, you're amazing. Bye, Bella. Mwah. Bye, girl. Mwah. Have a good one. Take care. It's pot and micro dots. <laughs> Bye, Tiffany. Ah, oh, that was so much fun. I'm so so glad I got to interview her. She is such a character. She, she really really is, and I really wish they would have had her on Rock of Love longer and Charm School. That would have been amazing. So anyway, um, I have a couple of shout outs. Uh, There's been some people that have been just super awesome, super supportive of me and of the podcast. I want to give a big, huge shout out to um, to Mike. Uh, Actually, you guys should check out his Instagram. He's a little hottie and he is an awesome person. Uh, At mike.p.official on Instagram. I want to give you a shout out. Thank you for being so awesome, Mike. Also, um, Frederick Lynette from Control Magazine. Thank you for your support. Uh, We have, of course, Evilness. Every week, she is just amazing. Super supportive of the podcast. We have Crystal and Zena and Jennifer Grogan, Desiree, Beth Loden, Annette, Brooke, Caitlin, Camille, Corey, Tyler, and Robert and Alex. Thank you guys so, so much for your tremendous support. You guys are amazing and I love you all so much. Um, If you guys are interested in uh, showing support for the podcast as well, then you can become a Talk of Love contributor. So just go to www.talkoflove.net and click on the contribute button. And there's all kinds of cool rewards. You can sign up for different tiers. Uh, For instance, if you do the $10 tier, then you get sent 
uh, reaction videos from me every week of all of the Rock of Love episodes, starting with season one, episode one, going chronologically all the way through the end. I do those once a week where you have my reaction to all of the shows, and I'll be sending those to you once a week. Um, the $20 tier people I'm doing Skype chats with. I've already Skyped with a ton of you. You guys are so awesome. Every single one of you has been super cool. It's nice to get to know you guys through that. So um, yeah, but just check it out. There's all kinds of different tiers, different award, different rewards, and um, it basically helps it so that I can get the podcast paid for, get everything rocking and rolling. You guys are helping me fund it and uh, we are here to stay. So I just wanna say thank you so much, you guys. I really, really appreciate you. Also, if you haven't done so already, please click the subscribe button uh, on YouTube and uh, that way you'll be notified every time there's a new podcast episode. Uh, make sure to click that thumbs up and leave your comments below. And uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for tuning in every week. I love you guys. And don't threaten me with a good time. Bye, guys. <laughs>